God bless you. If you have your Westover app, I invite you to go ahead and open it. We have our notes and scripture text there. If not, if you want to follow us in the Bible, we're in Genesis chapter 7 and chapter 8. And I'm going to be talking about waiting on God. I've entitled this message, Give It Time. I'm speaking to the young single adult. You have prayed that God would bring into your life that perfect match, that perfect person that would be your soulmate. And you've asked God and you're in a season of waiting. No one has come along that just fits the profile of your prayer and your waiting on God. The divorcee, you're healed from the past and you believe God wants to take you into a new season and you want to recover and have love again in your life. And you're waiting for that perfect person that will commit to you and you two can uh, build a wonderful home together. But you're waiting on God. It's the believer that has prayed prayers continually and saying, God, and you've asked the Lord to come through in an area. You've asked God to help you get out of debt. You've asked God to help you heal some. You've asked God to just to, to bring family reconciliation, to, to make something happen, that your dream would come to pass, and you're still praying. You're waiting on God. It's the business person that you've planned and you've strategized correctly for so long and you feel like it's your turn and your time, but you're waiting on God. And when we're waiting on God, we often feel like, Lord, when will it be my turn? God, why is it taking you so long? You're willing to move forward. You're willing to take that next step and you feel prepared and you feel ready. But God's open door has not come. You're waiting on God. For this message today, I want to take us to the Old Testament. It's the story in Genesis 7 and 8 of Noah and the flood. And I believe in this story we're going to glean truths that will help us understand this concept of waiting on God. By the way, Denise and I just a few years ago, we went to what's called the Ark Experience, the Ark Encounter. Do you know in Kentucky, they have built a replica, a life-size replica of Noah's Ark. And Denise and I, just a few years ago, we were up in Kentucky, and we took a day's journey up, and we toured it. And you know what? We went through the Ark just as the Bible said. We entered male and female, two by two that day, just as the Bible said. And we toured the Ark. It's a beautiful experience. You may want to do it sometime, but I believe in the story of the Ark and the flood, God could speak to us about waiting on him. In Genesis chapter number 7, verse 11 and 12, God had already spoken to Noah and he said, build an ark and prepare it. And God says at a certain time, there was going to be a flood, there's going to be rain. It had never rained upon the face of the earth before that moment. And he said, I'm going to bring all the animals in and the animals, your family will be safe in the ark during this time. And we read in G Genesis chapter 7, verse 11 and 12, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, all, uh, on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of heaven were opened, and rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Many of us here say, you know what, Pastor, I could do that. My wife and I, we love going cruising. Wow, what is it just nice being out there on the ocean and cruising? You have an idea of all you can eat buffets, and I hear you talk about it. It's the, the thing you talk about is not the ocean. You always talk about the food and the buffets when you come back from those. And the buffet and sleeping in to 10 o'clock every morning, it's a wonderful experience, great R and R. That's not what Noah and his family were experiencing. Let me just paint the picture without being crude. They were in the ark, and the smell and the stench of manure was everywhere. It's full of animals. Animals have smells attached to them. Can you imagine being in a confined space with all of those animals, and the stench and the smell of animals' manure is what you smell day and night for all of this time? 
Not only that, Noah and his family, they had to attend to the animals. There's watering, grain, food, taking care of them, cleaning out the cages, keeping the animals separate, attending to all the needs for all of this time. Can you imagine sleeping in the ark and all of those animal noises all the time? I don't know about you, but it bothers me when my neighbor's dog barks at night. And I'm just, when I hear that I'm trying to sleep and that dog's bark, I say, you know what, God, just, just, just go there and slap that dog right now. I want to sleep. Make that dog be quiet. I want to go to sleep. Can you imagine being in the ark and hearing that sound all the time? You're not resting. You're working every day. The cow has to be milked every day. And that's what they're going through. Which brings me to chapter number 8, verses 13 and following. It says, On the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water dried up from the earth. Noah removed the covering from the ark and he saw, notice that word, saw, I'll come back to it. He saw that the surface of the ground was dry. Here it is. God gave Noah a birthday gift. On his 601st birthday, God says, I'm going to give you a gift. The ark had been floating out there aimlessly for 314 days. Oh, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but the earth was covered by water. Then all of a sudden, the sun began to dry it out, and the waters receded. And finally, the ark lodged on Mount Ararat, and the waters continued to recede from that moment. And finally, on Noah's 601st birthday, God says, I've got a I've got a birthday gift for you. Take the covering of the ark off. And for the first time, Noah and his family had their first breath of fresh air in 314 days. No longer the stench of the animals. He could smell the beautiful fresh air. Uh, And he took that first fresh breath right at that moment. And the Bible says that Noah looked out and the Bible says he saw that the earth was dry, the ground had dried up. I'm sure Noah is thinking this. Ma, Noah, guess what? We can take the covering off. Now you know what we can do? We can see the earth is dry. We can get these animals out of here. We're finally going to get a vacation. We're going to get a break from taking care of all of these animals. And God said to Noah, wait. Have you ever had all your plans lined up? You're about to pull the trigger on something. You're about to move forward with something. You've lined it up. You planned it. You scheduled it. You have everything in place. And then you have to say, wait. Did you almost move and go off to college and enroll in that course? Then all of a sudden, at the last moment, a big weight came in your life. You couldn't move forward. You're about to buy the house, about to launch the business. Something significant is about to happen in your life. And about the time you take that step and you think everything is working out, God says, wait. That's what happened to Noah. God told him to wait for 57 more days after he took the covering of the ark off and he saw that the earth was dry. Notice verse number 14 and following. And by the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then the Lord said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you. Fifty-seven days after Noah saw that the earth was dry, God said, wait. It's not your time. And I believe in that God has something to say to us. And I want to share with us today that God is working in your waiting. God is at work when you're waiting. God is working in your waiting. Did you notice something in verse number 14? Verse number 13 says, Noah saw that the earth was dry. But verse number 14 says, but the earth became completely dry 57 days later you know when the earth dries and Noah looked at it the earth always dries on the crust on the surface first and what Noah did not see is just beneath the crust there was still mud it was still a quagmire 
He looks out there and day after day for 57 days, he's wondering, why can I go out? I can see the earth is dry. And God says, wait. And it wasn't until the 57th day after they took the covering of the ark off, God says you can go out. Do you know why? Because God calculated the weight of every animal. He knew how much the elephant, the water buffalo, the cow, the steer. He knew what every animal weighed. weighed and when it would put its foot or its hoof upon the soil, he, he factored in the pounds per square inch pressure and how much the earth needed to dry and the subterranean soil needed to be solid. So when that animal would put its foot upon the soil, it wouldn't sink into the quagmire. And had Noah gone out any earlier than that, that animal would have put its foot down in the quagmire. It would have stuck in the mud. And what he had worked on and been a part of for 314 days in the ark and all the time he'd worked ahead of time to build the ark would have been lost. For you see, the animals would have died. They would have been stuck in the quagmire and everything that Noah worked for would have been lost. But Noah said in verse number 13, I see it's dry. And God says it's not dry enough until it's under the surface. It's solid enough for that subterranean soil to weigh and carry the weight of the animal. You know, God sees what you and I don't see. God sees things that you and I don't see. Something is going on. Our plans are moving forward. And then all of a sudden, it feels like weight comes and we can't move forward. And we're saying, God, why did you fail me? God, I feel like you told me. God, I prayed for this. I believe it was the right thing to do. But God always sees what you and I don't see. And waiting on God means, waiting on God means staying where God said to stay when he tells you to stay there. Or it's going at the pace that God tells you to go. Waiting is staying at the place, the place that God says to stay at. And sometimes waiting is just going at the pace that God says to go. And some of us, we're not going at the pace that we want to. Things are going slower. And some of us, we feel like we're stuck in one place because God sees what you don't see. He sees under the surface. He sees all the hazards. He sees all the issues. He sees all the things that are going on that we don't recognize at the time. And we take confidence in the knowledge of this, that something is happening when nothing is happening. You think nothing's happening now? Noah looked out and he said, God, day after day, I see the earth is dry. Nothing is happening. But what Noah didn't understand is something was happening when nothing was happening. The earth was drying beneath it. And in your life and in your plans, when you feel like you're stuck, when you feel like you're going nowhere, when you're waiting on God, when you're in that holding pattern, when things are not moving forward and it feels like you're just going in circles time and time again, you take comfort in the fact that something is happening in your life even when you feel like nothing is happening in your life. God knows what's going on. He sees everything that's going on. Someone has written God's ways may twist and turn and my heart may throb and ache, but in my soul I'm glad I know he maketh no mistakes. Yes, he doesn't make a mistake in your life. And there are three thoughts that I want to share with you very briefly when you're in a waiting moment with God. And the first one is pray for God's purposes. When you're waiting on God, when you're trusting God in the waiting moments of life, Pray for God's purposes. Philippians chapter 4 tells us, don't be anxious. Uh, do, 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 don't get upset. Don't become nervous. It tells us there that we need to begin to, to pray that the, the peace that passes all understanding will fill our hearts, that we would have confidence that things that we don't understand, we can rest assured that God's purposes are being fulfilled. And I'm here to share with you prayer. Prayer allows the Spirit of God to take hold of the steering wheel of your life. Many of us, our emotions, our fears, our personality, our own preferences, our own rebellion, our own sin is at the steering wheel of our life. But prayer invites the Holy Spirit to take hold of the steering wheel of our life. 
and guide us in a path. Waiting sometimes does nothing more than help us refocus on God's purposes because every one of us, it's a temptation, isn't it? That we begin to plan and we begin to add our own agenda and our own plans to what God has and then pretty soon his purposes are no longer his purposes. His purposes is a remake and a remodel and we've changed what God originally designed for us and we've added our own agenda and then all of a sudden in the waiting moment of life and we begin to pray and we begin to seek God, prayer takes us back to the core issue. It's almost like God is tapping us on the shoulder in those times, trying to get our attention and beckoning us back to follow his purpose and walk with God. Single adult, you're praying for God to bring the right person in your life. Oh, I've heard the young lady pray before. God, I just believe you're going to bring that husband to my life. I believe, God, I prayed for him. I've waited. I've, I've purposed. I've been praying for this. And I want God to bring the right person. I want a man that will serve God. I want a man that will walk with God. I want a man that will go to church with us and help us build a solid Christian home. And, Pastor, that person hasn't come. I prayed for him. But the only ones that will invite me out on a date are people that don't go to church and they have a lifestyle that is inconsistent with my values. Could it be? Could it be God wants me to win them to the Lord through marriage? I'll just marry the guy. I'll just marry him and I will get him in church and I'll bring him to the Lord. And then all of a sudden, a guy comes in your life. He's, he, he's not a believer. He doesn't have the values you have. But you say, he's tall, dark, and handsome. You just described Darth Vader. Can I tell you something? <laughs> Be careful of him. Always pray for God's purposes and remind yourself of God's purposes. I remember a time we were pastoring this church the only property we owned was three acres, and we built the building that's the student center next door. And that was the, that three-acre property and that, that brick building next door was the only church building we had, and we knew that God wanted us to grow and wanted us to expand and reach more people. So we began to pray, God, in order to do that, we're going to have to have more property. And the property this side of the, of the student center, that's now the student center, we were wanting and believing God. He didn't make it come to pass. And I kept praying, God, just make that property available. And I remember a day that a man walked into my office and he introduced himself. He said, you're the pastor of this church. And I said, yes. He said, I'm in a part of a business deal and we're looking at procuring all the property, some 500 acres around here. And I want to know if the church would like to buy some property next to it. I said, absolutely. He said, we will sell you the property for $40,000 an acre. And that was an incredible buy at that time. And my heart leaped within me and I said, God... This is it. I know, Lord, this is what I've been praying for. We can buy property at $40,000 an acre. We will buy it. I told him we are committed for it. So we began to move forward the process. I announced it to the church. We were celebrating. We were expecting to buy the property, and then the deal fell through. They didn't buy the property. And then I began to fuss with God. I know you've never done that. But I began to fuss with God. I began to tell God, God, you messed up. God, you messed up. God, if you would have done it my way, I had this all figured out. We buy the property. We could build another auditorium. We could buy, have more parking. I had it all figured out. And I began to tell God how he messed up. And then 14 months later, a man walks into my office. I've never met him. He said, hello. I'm with a group of investors, and we have purchased all the property around the church, and we want to know if the church is interested in buying some of the property. My heart leaped within me, but I was a little bit afraid. No telling what the price has escalated to now, and I was worried that we couldn't afford it. And I asked him, what do you think you would sell it to us? He said, we'll make you an offer right now at $20,000 an acre. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Was that not a rebuke to me? So you see, if God had done it my way, 
we would have paid twice as much for the property. And for a year, I fussed with God. For a year, I told God how he messed up. And God is sitting up there, and he's saying, you just don't know that I'm going to dry up the soil. You don't know if I would have done that, you'd have paid more for it. And I had to trust God's purposes at the time. I just had to say, God, you're in charge. It's your church. And in your life, that's what you've got to do. God's called you. God's put you together. God has a plan. God is in charge of your business. You have to pray for God's purposes. Number two, rehearse God's promises. Rehearse God's promises. Second Peter chapter 3 tells us that God is not negligent about his promises. If God gives you a promise, you can trust God. And some of us, God has given us a promise of our business succeeding, of, of it becoming an incredible source of blessing. But you haven't seen it yet. You're waiting. Rehearse that promise in your heart. God's told you that he's going to bring the right person in your life. And that marriage is going to be one of, of, of spiritual happiness and spiritual uh, well, well-being in your life. And that there will be a spiritual bond that will be everything that you'd ever prayed and dreamed for. Rehearse that promise in your heart. God's talked to you about a healing. You've struggled with it. The doctor said you're going to have to learn to live with it. But in your heart, you believe God put a promise in your heart. He's going to heal you, but you haven't seen it come to pass yet. Rehearse. Rehearse that in your heart. Don't give up on it. Don't walk away from it. And many of us are suffering from what I call PD, promise deficiency. Yes, you have forgot the promise. God gave you a promise, and I'm here to tell you, God is not inconsistent and slack concerning his promises. And I can always spot PD, promise deficiency. It's hopelessness and despair. Get discouraged. Think it won't work out. I remember a time when Denise and I, we were in Bible school. Like many students, you're going to college. You never have enough money to go around. Denise and I are in Bible school. She's working to put me through Bible school. I'm going through Bible college and trusting God to provide. But there were just times we were so broke. I mean, we were so, we were so poor. We had nothing. A Dave Ramsey seminar would have not done us any good. You know why? Because we didn't have anything to put in those envelopes. You know, Dave Ramsey says, a rainy day fun, and you have all these. We had nothing to put in those envelopes. We had nothing. We were so poor. I filed my income tax that year, and the IRS sent me a sympathy card. We were so poor. I mean, we had nothing. And in those moments, you're trusting, God, what are you doing? You're so poor. And I tell you, we used to thank God. Some of you won't understand what I'm about to tell you. Some of you will track with me. Some of you are going to track. You know what? What floating a check means you know what a float of a check is this is the day before debit cards young adults you don't understand this before we had debit cards you'd write a check and they had a system that was before they had all the electronic uh, technology of that day you'd write a check at the grocery store they would process it at HEB it would go through their accounting department then they would mail it over to the bank the bank would get it it would process it and then it would finally post to your account. And we figured out between the day you write the check and the day it posted, you could get three, sometimes four days. You better not go five days or you're going to get a check that's going about. How many have ever floated a check? You know what I'm talking about? We used to say hallelujah for the float days. Hallelujah for the float days. Payday is three or four days away. But Denise could go down to the grocery store and we could get ketchup then. I mean, it's poor when, when you can just get ketchup and you're saying, hallelujah, there's a bottle of ketchup in the house. I mean, we would turn it, the bottle of ketchup on. How many of you ever added water to the ketchup to make it go? That's how poor we are. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, in those moments you're doing without, and I can remember during the seasons, I would just have to rehearse the promise of God. God, you called us. God, we're adding water to the ketchup. We're having to buy groceries on floating checks. God, somehow, someway, you're going to get us through this. God, you're going to make it come to pass. Your promise will be fulfilled. You've called us, and God, you called us. You're going to provide, and you just have to rehearse the promises of God in your heart. 
There are times that's how you live. That's how you get through it. Can I share with you? True. Some of you are not going to initially accept what I'm going to tell you. God sends text messages. Yes, he does. God will send text messages. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? Yes, he does. In this Bible, there are over 31,000 scripture texts. Okay? There's over 31,000 scripture texts. And he'll send you a text. I mean, I mean, sometimes you'll open the Bible, you'll be reading, and you'll say, that's God's word. And it's like the Holy Spirit put his hand between the ink and the pages, and he lifted that verse off, and he put that promise in your heart. That's when God will text message your heart, and he puts a promise in your spirit. There are pages in my Bible that have tears on it. There are pages in my Bible, these pages are wrinkled and frayed and, and soiled. Why? Because I put my hand upon it, and I've sweated and cried over it and said, that's that's my promise. God, I'm going to stand upon it. I'm not going to give up. And in those moments, guess what you do? You rehearse the promises of God. And God has a text for every context of life. Yes, he does. And thirdly, not only, not only do you rehearse the promises of God, but you rest in the presence of God. You rest in the presence of God. Isaiah chapter 26 says this, that God will give perfect peace to those whose minds are upon the Lord and will trust him. And in your waiting moment, in your waiting season, rehearse, rehearse the promise of God. Pray for the purpose of God. And then I'm going to invite you to do something many of us have not acquired yet. It's still a struggle. You're still losing sleep. You're still in emotional turmoil. It's because you haven't learned to rest in the presence of God. You get in his presence. Oh, I know it's an old school song. There are times that I just walked my office and got alone with God and sung that old chorus. In the presence of Jehovah, God Almighty, Prince of Peace, troubles vanish, hearts are mended in the presence of the King. And in that moment, I just rest in God's presence. You just rest in the Lord and some of us today the Lord sent me this weekend to tell you rest in his presence your, your mind you can't sleep at night because it's racing and you're wondering and you're just torturing yourself your home your home has become a dungeon of anxiety and conflict and tension and God wants that house to be filled with his presence and to be a sanctuary of his peace. And when you're waiting on God, you just rest in his presence. Waiting on God is better than wading through the mud. And Noah learned that. When he thought the earth was dry, it was not completely dry. And there are times you just, you rest in the presence of the Lord. And I sense in this house the Holy Spirit. I just sense his presence right now. And in a prayer moment, in just a moment, he's going he's gonna to lift tension off of heart. You're going to feel it. You're just going to feel it lifting, lifting. He's going to unburden your heart. Yes. All the questions and all the Arguments of your heart and anxiety and tension is just going to, it's going to lift. And God's going to give you his peace. His peace. So right now across the auditorium, would you just close your eyes for a moment of prayer across the auditorium? 
Holy Spirit, you're here. And you're speaking to individual hearts and lives. You're unburdening. You're unlocking doors right now, secret areas. Tension. Unresolved conflict. Insecurity. Wow. Insecurity. God's going to heal you of that. He's going to bring his confidence and his assurance. And there are many of us that need that right now. You need to learn to rest in the presence of God. And with an upraised hand, if this speaks to your heart, we're going to just have a prayer moment just so I can see your hand and I can pray for you individually. And you say, Pastor, that's me. That's where I'm at. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now. Balcony there. Yes, just, oh, God bless you. Yes. God sees. God sees. Yes, he does. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is here. Yes. Jesus said in his word, he gives peace. Yes, he does. Yes, sir. God bless you. He wants to bring you peace. And I sense it. I sense God is healing anger. God's, God's healing condemnation and you're beating up on yourself. What have I done wrong? You pointed to other people. God's answered their prayer. How come not mine? I must be wrong. I must not deserve it. Don't. Don't let the enemy do that to you. If God's called you to wait, it doesn't mean that God has demoted you. It means that God's timing is still being designed. Heavenly Father, I sense in this auditorium there are people that need to be unburdened from the tension, the frustration, anxiety, and insecurity. They have been diligent. They have prayed. God, they've taken steps of obedience, but what they prayed for has not come to pass. What they have believed God, what they feel like that God spoke to them, the promise they have not seen it come to realization and fruition yet. And God, they've been to, they're beginning to second guess you and doubt themselves. Lord, they have prayed for your purpose. They are standing on your promise. But they need to rest in your presence. And I pray that right now. I pray God lift despair in Jesus name lift it lift those torturing memories lift God the tension oh God the despair off of their heart the despondency the hopelessness God lift it off of them yes Jesus now bathe them in your peace let your peace come into their hearts. Let your peace come into their minds. Oh God, give them assurance of your presence. Oh God, let them know about what you can do and you're, you're faithful in their life. And we pray, God, for those that are in the waiting season of life, they will trust you. They will see your hand at work. They'll have a new assurance and a new confidence that what you've said you will do. And I pray, God, that you will just, you will renew the promise that they stood on. You will renew the promise that they have embraced. And I speak blessing and goodness upon your people. In Jesus' name. Thank you for being with us today. Go encouraged in your spirit. God bless you. You're dismissed.